And now we come to the, uh, the third aspect of this sutta. And uh, so now it says, uh, so you should truly see any kind of form at all, past, future or present, uh, internal or external, coarse or fine, inferior or superior, far or near, all form uh, with right understanding. This is not mine, I am not this, uh, this is not myself. The consequences of all the things we have just seen now is that you, you see all form, yeah, sabbang, sabbang rupang, all form, uh, as uh, as nothing to do with you basically, uh, as just the aspects of nature, nature doing its things, uh, and uh, in the middle of that nature you have planted the sense of self. Why do you plant yourself in the middle of nature? Well, that was a mistake. And now you're trying to undo that mistake. Actually, it's not. It was the mistake has always been there. But this is kind of the idea behind this. Uh, so don't plant a little flag, a little flag with your name on it. And this is me. Uh, this is kind of the idea of having a sense of self, uh, because it doesn't relate to anything that actually exists, uh, and that is the problem. Uh, so this is about uh, yata bhuta nanadasa, not truly seeing. Yata bhutang is the Pali word here, I think. Yeah. Yata bhutang kasati, yeah, and some. Samapanyaya, okay, so with right, uh, with right knowledge, uh, okay, yeah. yeah, that's the bottom one there, but the top one, so you should truly see, what is that? Uh? You can't, so, <laughs> okay, yeah. ah, okay, Yankinshi Rupang, yeah, Some of the mind. Yeah. Okay. So that, that's probably. Uh, yeah. So he has he has divided up seeing, which is data bang see and samapanya. They occur together in the Pali. He has divided up, put them far apart. That's why it's a bit hard, hard to compare it to the English translation here. So to be seen according to reality. Yeah. With the right understanding. Yeah. Okay. So. Uh, yeah, so this is the idea here. Yeah, once you see form in this way, then you abandon your interest in it. It doesn't really, it's no longer of any interest to you. So you give up the, the sense of a body, the sense of appearance, and all those kind of things. And you have no relationship to it anymore. You used to have a relationship to it as me and mine, but you lose that sense of relationship. And that is what it means to be liberated from form. The fact that you don't have any desire or interest in it anymore. And that makes your mind peaceful when you are liberated from form in this way. Right understanding, mine, I am, self, all of these this three kind of uh, uh, distortions uh, of the mind that uh, cause all the papancha, all that is given up in regard to form. This is all very profound, yeah? so just, just take this as a uh, kind of conclusion of this little retreat. We're taking some of the really profound stuff at the very end here. But uh, nevertheless, I think it is interesting to have some idea of, uh, of this. Uh, so uh, for that reason, it's good to go through it. Uh, so what next? Uh, you should truly see any kind of feeling at all, past, future or present, eternal or external, coarse or fine, inferior or superior, far or near, all feeling with right understanding. This is not mine. I am not this, uh, this is not myself. Uh, yeah, again, the idea that feelings come and go. There's no point in holding on to it. Uh, and again, the idea that feeling is kind of the, uh, the thing that motivates everything we do almost in life. And if that is uh, out of control, well, then kind of things don't have all that much meaning anymore. Uh, and you start to abandon, you start, this is why this is the, uh, again, as I mentioned before, this is where the, uh, true insights into the nature of existence can arise because feeling is so fundamental to what it is to be any kind of being, really. So all feelings, yeah, even the feelings in the jhana states or the deep samadhi, they are impermanent. You enter jhana and then you come out afterwards. And so even these things are ultimately unreliable. They are caused by volition, driven by volition, just as the, the metta, as you mentioned before, is created by the will and created by intention. In the same way is true for all the jhana states and everything else. Uh, so ultimately it is uh, impermanent and unreliable there. Uh, all feelings, uh, you give it up. Uh, it's hard to, hard to relate to. What does it mean that you give up feelings? It means that you don't cling on to it anymore. Yeah? 
feelings are still painful if you have a pain in the body or whatever, but you don't actually make anything out of it. Uh, you see it as nature doing its thing, yeah? yeah, and you don't actually add any extra suffering to it. That's what it means to be letting go of these things. Uh. So you should truly see any kind of perception at all, past, future or present, eternal, external, coarse or fine, inferior or superior, far or near, all perception uh, with right understanding. This is not mine, I am not this, uh, this is not myself. Uh. And so that is a very large part of everything in the world, yeah, because everything in the world is basically perceived. Uh, and so uh, everything, you giving up pretty much everything around you that you perceive in one way or another, by, by contemplating this, uh, all perception, uh, everything is uncertain, regardless of how refined and wonderful and marvelous and etc. Still, it has to go. Uh. <laughs> um, what was that? Uh? Go away. Go away. Nowhere. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, uh, uh, yes. So, uh, again, uh, there's not much left after a while. It pretty kind of gets. So then we move on to the, uh, the choices. Uh, we should truly see any kind of choices at all past, future, or present, internal, external, coarse, and fine, inferior, superior, far or near. All choices with right understanding. This is not mine. I am not this. This is not myself. Yeah. Again, this is very difficult to do because choices are so near to us. We are the choosers. We are the creators in the world. We are the makers. We are the movers and shakers. And uh, so this is what it feels like. So giving up choice is like giving up something that is very, very uh, close to your heart. And uh, for that reason, it is very, very hard. Yeah. If the choice is not you, then maybe there's not worth anything worth doing in the world. Uh, and that kind of makes life very difficult almost. If nothing is worth doing, uh, what are you going to do if nothing is worth doing? Uh? <laughs> well, it, maybe, I don't know, maybe you become a monk, you, you know, you, you just chill in the cave or something. Yeah, that's probably what you end up doing. Yeah. So uh, you do the least possible because choices are a problem. Uh, and they are not yours, they just arise out of cause and conditions anyway. And so why being concerned about them? And on top of arising out of cause and conditions, they are an irritation to the mind, all this doing. So it's just, it's just bad upon bad. That's kind of the idea here. And it feels so good, even though it is bad upon bad. This is kind of the weird thing. And again, the Buddha turns the world upside down. Yeah. The, <coughs> the, you are the creator. What are you the creator of? Well, really, just suffering at the end of the day. That's what you are the creator of. Uh, and this is what the Buddha, how the Buddha sees it. Uh, so uh, it's kind of interesting. Yeah? In, in the world, we often put people who are creative people, we put them on the pedestal because they kind of create stuff and we can enjoy the creations of other people. We tend to think of them as great. Yeah? Technology, the creators of technology, for example, they are the creative people in the world. Uh, or the creative people in the arts, yeah, they are the creative people who create beautiful things that we can enjoy. Yeah. But uh, the Buddha says all of this creation stuff is just a, uh, just a pain, that's what, that's what he says. So it's kind of strange, we're putting pain on the pedestal. Yeah. Not a good idea. <laughs> okay. You should truly see any kind of consciousness at all. Past, future, or present, internal or external, coarse or fine, inferior or superior, far or near, all consciousness, sabbang vinyanang, with the right understanding. This is not mine, I am not this, this is not myself. And this is like the final frontier of the self, the final place where the self holds out, I am consciousness. But then, as Ni Wern rightly points out, there are six of these blooming consciousnesses, yeah? And because there are six of them, they are not solid. They are impermanent, unreliable, moving from one to the other. And they are, for that reason, not really worthy of holding on to. There's nothing there except uh, uh, the continuing round of rebirth. That is really all there is when there's consciousness. Uh, and consciousness is in the, the holding on to consciousness, in a way, is the root of all the problems. Uh, 
Now, what is very interesting about this particular paragraph, you will notice here, you should truly see any kind of consciousness at all. All consciousness with right understanding. All, yeah? Sabbang vinyana, yeah? And uh, sometimes you hear this idea in Buddhist circles that there are certain kind of consciousnesses that are exempt from dukkha, yeah? The kind of consciousness, the uh, anidasana vinyana, the, or that kind of thing, or the... Uh, the apatitita vinyana, the non-established consciousness, uh, and they will take these obscure passages in the canon, which can very easily be explained otherwise anyway, they take them to refer to some kind of final ground of all being, which sounds exactly very similar to what they found in, uh, in Hinduism, yeah? where they have this idea of Advaita Vedanta, the non-dual uh, Vedanta teachings, uh, the non-dual consciousness at the base of all reality. Uh, but uh, actually the Buddha says all consciousness uh, is not me, not mine, not a self. Everything needs to be given up. That's really what he's saying here. And so uh, this is uh, very challenging yeah, and it's very, very profound. And this is what makes Buddhism, Buddhism is this specifically this insight into the nature of consciousness and the mind that, uh, is, uh, that uh, distinguishes Buddhism from the preceding teachings of uh, uh, the, the Vedas and the Hinduism and Brahmanism and Vedanta and all of these kind of things. This is where the Buddha was different. Uh, and this is what distinguishes everything he did. Uh, and so it's an important point, uh, part of this, uh, uh, the, uh, the practice of Buddhism. It's profound yet important. Uh, so this is uh, the, uh, yeah, so this is um, kind of the conclusion pretty much of this particular sutta. Um, so, let's, it's not quite a conclusion, so let's go all the way to the end. Seeing this, a learned noble disciple grows repelled by form, repelled by feeling, repelled by perception, repelled by choices, and repelled by consciousness. Repelled here is nib, nib, nibida or nibindati. And the idea that you turn away from something, you turn away because you understand it's suffering. There's nothing there of inherent interest to you. And if something is not interesting, yet it is suffering, then you turn away. The reason why we are interested in the five khandas is because we see a self in there. We see something of value. But the moment there turns out to be no self there, then it doesn't have an inherent value anymore to us. All it is is an impermanent mass of suffering going on. As so you turn away from the five khandhas, uh, this is kind of the, uh, the outcome of this sort of contemplation. So the noble disciple, yeah, the Arya Pugala, grows repelled by all of these things, uh, choices and consciousness. Uh, being repelled, uh, desire fades away. So when you have Nibbida, you have Viraga as a consequence of that. Viraga is again the idea of fading away of everything. Uh, yeah? Uh, fading away of desire, fading away of interest in these things. Uh, and when desire fades away, when it ultimately fades away completely, the uh, ending of tanha, yeah, tanha kaya, as you see so often in the suttas, uh, uh, you find it in the third noble truth, that destruction or ending of tanha, then you are freed. And when they are freed, they know that they are freed. The freedom is the ending of craving. Craving is what always drives you on. Craving, craving is what compels you to move in the world. Yeah, you com you're compelled. Craving is a slave drive that drives you from one thing to another one. And the moment craving is destroyed, you are no longer a slave. You are freed from slavery because craving is what kind of a, you can now suddenly you can relax. Yeah, because craving is not driving you on as a slave. You can finally relax. You can just sit, sit back and you can enjoy the peace of here and now. You can enter deep samadhi and all of these kind of things. And we couldn't do that before. And this is why, and uh, this is kind of, I think, an, an important point in this, is that you have actually found the meaning of life. Because what is it that we are searching for with craving? Well, craving is promising us some kind of meaning down the track. Yeah, We're trying to find fulfillment, trying to find contentment, trying basically to find meaning. Yeah? When there is no more craving, it means that you are fully content. You don't need to search for anything more. Yeah? And uh, so that lack. Full ending of the search means that you have found meaning as well. 
Meaning is complete. Contentment is complete. Uh, you found the answer that you were always looking for. Uh, and that's for that reason, craving stops. Uh, there's no more answer to be searched for. Uh, there's no more existence that you need to find out about. Uh, there's nothing in the world that you need to figure out anymore. Uh, so you are freed. Uh, and when you are freed, the good news is that you know that you are freed. Uh, you don't have any doubts about it. If you think you may be an arahant, maybe not, you are not an arahant. Uh, yeah, so just <laughs> so uh, if you had any doubts about that, now you know the truth about that one. Huh? So, um, uh. they understand rebirth is ended, the spiritual journey has been completed, uh, what had to be done has been done, and there is no return to any state of existence. So, um, yeah, this is the purpose of the Buddhist path, huh? and you have come to the very end of everything here. Yeah. That is what the Buddha said, uh, satisfied the group of five mendicants were happy with what the Buddha said. Uh, and while this discussion was being, this course was being spoken, the minds of the group of five monks or mendicants was freed from the defilements by not grasping here. Uh, they all became arahants while this discourse was being spoken here. Uh, that's the power of some of these discourses. Uh, it leads to some powerful insights. Uh, and uh, so that is the. Um, so why is it that uh, people became um, arrogant in those days uh, when reading this discourse? Why is it that people now they read it and they don't become arrogant? <laughs> what is what is the difference? The difference is, firstly, because your mind is not in samadhi. Yeah? That's the first thing. Yeah? So when you come out of deep samadhi and you read this discourse, when you are on your own, yeah, you come to Jhana Grove, you sit with a meditation, and then you kind of go back to your room and you read this sutta, then there is a chance yeah, of the kind of having these kind of insights. Yeah? So this is the main reason. The mind just isn't ready. It doesn't have that power, the ability to really penetrate. Yeah? So we read through it like this, and you kind of get a superficial idea of what is going on, but it doesn't really go into these things fully and properly in 100%. Uh, and so you kind of uh, have a, you know, don't have a, that great clarity about these things. Uh, and uh, so this is kind of part of the problem. Huh? And uh, so, uh, yeah, so this is kind of the difference probably from then and now, and probably also the Buddha was very profound and very powerful and very inspiring. So you felt very inspired when you heard it as well. Huh? And especially after being with the Buddha for a long time, probably there were a number of suttas spoken, and then the, the monks were gradually being kind of accustomed to this way of looking at things. And then finally came the final kind of blast, and then bang, the uh, defilements were all dispelled as a consequence. Uh, and then they became arahants uh, as, a, as a result of that. Uh. So um, anyway, so... The, this last sutta, I did it mostly because it is uh, nice to see these things all the way. It is maybe not super duper practical for everyone. Maybe a little bit practical because all of these things have practical sides. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, there you are. Now you have seen uh, suttas of all kinds, from the deepest uh, to the most uh, uh, you know, regular ones that talk about ordinary practices and ordinary things. And uh, so that is... Uh, that is that. So, you want to add something? Please add away. Yeah. So, if anyone you know, wants to be an arahant in Thailand just recently, yeah. there's a woman. Uh -huh. She said that uh, she can take you mm. to the state of arahantship. Is that what she said? <laughs> yeah. Okay. If you, she has like, it's not a Probably a course or something that if you pay twenty five thousand bucks, yeah. <laughs> she, she she can take you there. She said that you you don't you don't have to come and see her or anything. She can talk to you on the phone or something like that. Yeah. Did did you take the course, venerable? <laughs> <laughs> Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> I would like to try. You would try. <laughs> See what happens. <laughs> yeah, just last month. Really? It was in the news, and I also 
uh, saw her, you know, on on Facebook. She she said, "What's wrong with that?" You know, what's wrong with that? Yeah, <laughs> she didn't do anything wrong, you know, by advertising what she can do. It's up to you, you know, if you want to pay her. <laughs> you know, she doesn't force you to pay her to take the course or thing like that. She's still yeah. kind of not that old, you know, probably in her 40s. Okay. She, she said uh, she can, you know, yeah. go into your heart, your mind, or whatever, and then she can take you there. <laughs> if anyone interested. Huh? Does she give money back guarantee? <laughs> yeah, she guarantee. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she guarantee. <laughs> I, I think there's some taken. <laughs> okay, that's just it. Yeah, right. Okay. Mm. <laughs> The world is full of scallywags, that's what I say. <laughs> so, yeah, okay, thank you for that story. That's nice to hear, actually, what's going on in the Buddhist world. I thought, uh, yeah, anyway, it's kind of fa fascinating, yeah. So, uh, yeah. Um, mm. so, um, so, what now? And, <laughs> Maybe, maybe I should summarize a little bit, because to, so, so many things, right? And if we don't summarize, you forget absolutely everything. What, what is really important in all of this? Uh, what is not important? Yeah, what should we focus on in our life? And um, I think you know already what you should focus on. I probably don't have to say all that much. Uh, uh, but a lot of the things we learn about in the Dhamma is like things that you leave at the back of your mind. Yeah. You leave it there and it kind of gradually grows to fulfillment and gradually the understanding gradually grows. And then when the time is right, you remember these teachings and then they have a certain power. It's like you have right view and right view kind of is latent, is dormant. It sits there waiting for the right occasion to really grow. And then bang, and one day you see what is going on. That is kind of the purpose here. And so your job is just to understand where you are on the path. Yeah, what, is your, what are your needs? What do you need to do to go, go forward? And that will vary a little bit for everyone. Everyone is a little bit different. What are your kind of biggest defilements? What are the things that you need to look at? Yeah? And, uh, but generally speaking, it's, uh, the path is not that complex. The path is fairly, uh, you know, fairly straightforward. And if you focus on simple things like just being kind at all times, uh, that is often all you have to do. And usually at the end of a retreat, I usually ask, are you able to remember one thing here? And so I ask this now, are you able to remember one thing here? Usually I, I mess with people with so you know, people are always a bit worried when they answer, what is he, what is he up to now? And uh, people always tend to say yes, so they did when I started saying this. I said, yes, we can remember one thing here. And the truth is, you can't always remember one thing, and that's the reality of it. Uh, if I say that you should remember one thing, and that one thing is kindness, uh, can you always remember kindness? The answer is, you think so, but you can't, yeah? It goes out the window sometimes. You're really busy, you're on your mobile phone texting away, someone sends you an angry text and you text back in anger very quickly because you, that's kind of it happened so fast. Oops, I sent the wrong kind of text, yeah? I should have sent that one, that was a bad idea. I don't know, I've never texted in my life, so I have no idea how it works, but I'm guessing that's kind of how it works. So. So uh, sometimes we forget about it, yeah? And the idea of kindness is so simple. It's a simple idea, and yet we forget about it. So how can we remember it? And the way to remember it, and I, I actually quite like this simile, that uh, the way to remember kindness is not always to be mindful, because mindfulness is not strong enough. And that's why we still get upset. That is why we still say bad things, because mindfulness is not powerful enough to keep on reminding us what is right. And so instead of mindfulness, come back to the idea of right view. Yeah, the idea of crossing a road. I think that's a very nice way of thinking about it. Why is it that you always remember to look left and right when you're going to cross a road? And the reason is because you have right view. Right view, you know it is dangerous. That is the right view. Yeah? And that right view overrides everything else. That right view brings back your mindfulness so that you do look left and right when you come to that road. Yeah? 
Yeah, that is the power of right view. And exactly the same thing in Buddhism, in the teaching of the Dhamma. The way that you're going to be kind is to ensure that you have right view. So right view is what you should work on a lot. And then that will ensure that you always remember to be kind in all situations. Even in when you think. You don't have an angry thought. You don't have any thought of bad things. You just think, wow, kind thoughts all the time. Wouldn't that be nice? Always having kind thoughts. So how do you do that? And so, and one of the very, some of the principles that I have spoken about on this retreat are very useful for that. Yeah, right view. One of the foundation, founding things of right view is the death contemplation, for example. It reminds you very powerfully of impermanence. If death is always potentially around the corner, it could happen today, you have to be ready now. Are you ready to die now? That's the question. Am I ready to die now? Hmm. Maybe, maybe not. Yeah. So, are you ready now? This is the question you should ask yourself. And if you are ready now, good. But usually what it means, no, I have to do the right thing now because I don't know what's going to happen next. And just a simple reminder like that of the impermanence of everything in the world. You never know what's going to happen next. You can add to that death contemplation by reminding yourself that everything is so out of control. Everything is always shaking. You don't know when you're going to have the possibility to practice in these teachings again in the future. You don't know how long Buddhism is going to last. You don't know how long you're going to be alive. You don't know when the next world war is coming. You don't know anything very much. Yeah, Everything is just kind of shaking, waiting for the big earthquake to allow everything to crumble to the ground and nothing is left standing. And then what happens to your Buddhist practice? So now is the opportunity, now is the chance, understanding the urgency of things. This is what right view is about, understanding that you need to practice as if your hair is on fire. If your hair is on fire, are you going to yawn and say, I'll put it out later on? No, you're not going to yawn at all. You're going to be clear as your mind is going to become incredibly bright and clear. Yeah? And then you're going to put out that fire straight away. Yeah? Because that is the problem. That is how the Buddha said we should practice. Because that is how important it is. So this, these are some simple ideas to think of. A bit of death contemplation. The right view to support your practice of sila. And to uphold all of these things because they are difficult to remember. Remember to always come back to the Dhamma. And every one of you will come back to Dhamma in different ways. Some of you will enjoy reading the suttas a little bit, yeah? And some of you may, uh, I would also recommend watching some of the sutta explanations, similar to the kind of thing we have done on this retreat, yeah? And we have these at the BSWA. You have them in a number of other places. We have mentioned before Bhante Sujari, Rikha Bodhi, and probably many others as well who have that ability. So listen to other people explaining the word of the Buddha. Come back to the word of the Buddha. And if not that, then at the very least, listening to people who explain the Dhamma in, uh, in line with the word of the Buddha. So you get good teachings. Uh, yeah? Make sure that you, you are circumspect about what teachings you listen to. Don't listen to too many different teachers. Uh, have a few that you choose are your teachers. Uh, if there's too many, you get confused after a while. Uh, the Buddha as number one, and maybe a few others to kind of you know, help back up the word of the Buddha, if you like. Uh, but sometimes people listen too much to Dhamma, too many teachers, they're completely confused about what is up and what is down. They don't know, uh, you know black from white or forward from backward, and they, and they get, uh, you know, yeah. But um, so you make some good choices about what is good, uh, and then listen to Dhamma when you need it. Uh, listen to the Dhamma, not so much to understand the teachings, because you, everyone here probably, maybe not everyone, but most of you already understand enough. Uh, yeah, you know the Dhamma, you know the basic ideas, you know what you should be doing. So listen instead to be inspired. Listen to give you that energy that you require to keep on practicing. That is what you should be looking for. So if you feel that you are a bit down, the energy is lacking a little bit, that is the time you need to be inspired to get back on the practice again. Things that help you to be more kind in your life. Kindness is so important, yeah, incredibly important. If you can be kind right now, right away, it brightens the mind immediately. This is the power of these things. And so understanding that power, then your meditation will come together, then the samadhi will happen, and then down the track, even the deep insights may happen for some of you at least, yeah? those of you who really are able to do this thing fully.
So that is my suggestion to you as a brief little summary of this retreat. And now I have good news. Tea time. <laughs> okay, very good.